Hello, my name is Kishwani. This K E S H W A N I Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you buy 2020 edition and always make sure the book is in front of you as we are doing the work together. Today we'll solve some problem that you will find on page number 469. It's the beginning of the new section which means the first few questions that we're going to do are going to be very simple, very straightforward. Let's begin. If at the end of the video you find it helpful and you, would like, and you decide that you would like to work with me, you can always get hold of me at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Just send me an email or you can always reach me to my website, kishmaniprep.com. Let's begin. Number one. Number one says that 3x, 3x plus 3 is equal to 27. And of course, we have to solve for x. As we can see there, they are all multiples of 3. 3, 3, 27. Let's divide the entire equation by 3. And if you do that, we'll end up with x plus 1 is equal to 9, which means x is equal to 8. Nothing to it. Number two. Number two says, Number two says that, and you can read the problem yourself. It's a long, very uh, wordy problem, very verbose, uh, windy, uh, wind, uh, winded problem, long-winded problem. You can read it yourself. This is the gist of it. It says that 1c equals 7p. And the question simply is, how much is 140c equal to? How many, how many p is 140c? So it's very simple. If 1c is equal to 7p, then 140C must be 140 times this amount. And as you look at the answer choices, the only answer choice that makes sense here is D. You don't even have to do it out to, to see what it comes out to be. It'll be a waste of time. You can see all the other A, B, and C are not going to make sense. The answer is D. Next one. Number three. Number three says 2n over 5 equals 10. And the question is, how much is 2n minus 1? Well, let's find out, shall we? If 2n over 5 is 10, let's multiply both sides by 5. So 2n is equal to 50. And therefore, 2n minus 1 would simply be, 2n minus 1 would simply be 49. You just subtract 1 from it. That was number 3. Don't get too excited, they're not going to go like this as the, as the section pro progresses. For example, the very next one is a tricky one, number 4. Number 4 here, it says, square root of x squared is equal to x. Now, before we get into the problem itself, let's talk about what is known as principal root. What exactly is a principal root? For example, for example, if somebody were to come up to us, if somebody were to come up to us and ask us what is square root of 16, the proper answer is square root of 16 can be either positive 4 or negative 4. There are two possibilities because negative 4 squared will give us 16 and positive 4 squared will give us 16. That is only if we have 16 on the root sign and numerical value. But instead of 16, if somebody asks us what's the square root of x, what's the square root of x, and later on if you were to find out that x actually equals 16, in that case, the answer would not be positive or negative 4 because it's not a numerical value, it's an algebraic uh, quantity. This will only be, this will have to be positive quantity. This is called, this is known as principal square root. Principal square root or also sometimes it is known as non-negative root. Non-negative root. It has to be positive quantity. A negative quantity is not allowed. Non-negative, non-negative root is just a fancy way of saying that it is allowed to be zero, it just can be negative. It can be zero or positive. That's what's going to apply here. So let's begin our process. The question is, which of the following, which of the following is not a solution? Which of the following is not a solution? Okay. Let's start with, let's start with answer choice D. D says, what does D say? D says 3. D says x is equal to 3. 
in which case it will be 3 squared. This is all we, all we have to establish is that this is correct. But let's find out. Let's see. 3 squared is 9 and the square root of 9 because 3 represents the x. Remember that even though it says 3, x equals to 3, which means this quantity is only allowed to be positive. So the square root of 9 here will simply be positive 3, not negative 3. And the question is, does positive 3 equal positive 3? The answer, of course, is yes. So D is not the answer because we're looking for something that is not the solution. Let's look at C. Let's look at C. I'm going very slowly for, only for a reason because this is a very simple problem and yet people miss the point on this thing, people get it wrong only because of this, this concept of principal rule. C says x is equal to 1. If x is equal to 1, if x is equal to 1, 1 squared is 1 and square root of 1 would simply be positive 1. Negative 1 is not allowed. And they tell you that this quantity has to equal x. So if x is 1, is, does 1 equal 1? The answer is of course yes, which means c is also okay. c is also okay and so is b because b is just 0. This b is also okay because it's just 0. The square root of 0 is just 0, which is 0. Let's look at answer choice a, shall we? I wonder what the right answer to this problem is. Answer choice a says that x is equal to negative 4. Let's see if that's going to work. Can x be can x be negative 4? Let's find out, shall we? So if you substitute the value of x in here, if you substitute the value of x in what is given to us, the equation that is given to us, we end up with square root of negative 4 squared equals negative 4. Negative 4 squared is 16. And remember, this 16 only has principal root, only positive root, not negative root. So this quantity is square root of 16 in this context equals positive 4. And does positive 4 equal negative 4? The answer, of course, it does not. This is not the solution. B, C, and D can be the solution to this equation, but not A. And that's what it is. Before I completely forget it, before I completely forget, let's put it here because I want to leave that there for a second. So that was it, number four. We have come across, we have come across this concept of principal root twice already. Twice already, I'm going to tell you where, where we came across. On page number 337, problem number 14. Go back and look at them again. On day number 2. Today is our day 14. And we also came across it on page number 3, 600, 463, problem number 15. Just yesterday. Just yesterday. Today is day 14. Just yesterday we came across a situation like this where we were dealing with principal root. Make sure you understand the concept that whenever algebraic expression is put under the square root sign, it cannot, it is not allowed to have negative value. And the reason is because it creates ambiguity. I don't know which one you're talking about here. Because, for example, look, if, for example, it tells you the square root of p equals 7, then obviously p has to have a unique value. It cannot be two values, because two different values cannot equal 7. It has to have a unique value, and the unique value would be here, in this case, would be positive 49. It cannot be negative. It, it cannot be negative. Uh, uh, two values. Do you understand? That was number four. That took some time. Number five, I'm going to change the marker because this marker I don't like. Number five is another straightforward one. So what's going on in number five is we have a temperature of coffee when it comes out when it comes out of a, let's just say, microwave. That's what the question is asking. What's the, what's the temperature of coffee when it just comes out of the microwave based on the graph that they give us? And the graph that they give us looks something like this. And you have to look at it very carefully. Here's your 200, here's your 100, here's your, here's your 100. I'm going to first reproduce the graph so we have it. And I'm going to put it in a different color so we can see it. And if you look closely, you will see that it starts just under 200. It starts just under 200, not quite at 200. And then it falls, the temperature falls, something to this effect. This is, this is roughly what the graph looks like if you look in the book. Now we can answer our question. The question was, what's the temperature, what's the temperature of coffee when it just comes out of the microwave? The answer is, the answer is it is just 
just under 200 and therefore the correct answer is D because D says 195 answer choice D says 195 and that will be the correct answer because all the others do would not make sense temperature by looking at the graph you can safely say that the coffee when, when it just comes out of the microwave it is not at 155 degrees or 100 degrees or 75 degrees that's all there was let's answer the next question number six which is also based on the same graph number six says let me read to you because I did not write it down number six says during which of the following 10 minute time period does the temperature of coffee decrease at the greatest average rate so we have 10, 10 minutes time period on the graph and the question is during which time period it falls the fastest which is another way of saying where is the slope steepest where is the slope steepest and the answer is simply answer is this from from 0 to 10 it gets cold it gets cold fastest as you can keep as you can clearly see this is where it falls the fastest and then the slope becomes less and less steep in other words the slope is in other words there is the, it has the steepest slope the steepest slope it has the steepest slope during the first time first 10 minutes which was a ridiculous question of course obviously the coffee is going to get cold fastest when it just comes out of the microwave it was a silly question Number seven. Number seven is a very straightforward geometry question. We are told that x is equal to 100, and the question is how much is y. And here is the picture that is given to us. Something like this. Something with this effect. Okay, that's close enough. So here is a, b. I don't know why I need to put this thing. We don't need. To, we, we don't need any of this mumbo jumbo. But this is what is given to us and this is this we are told is 20 degrees this is x degrees and this is 40 degrees so let's find out why is i'm going to change the color so we can keep our work separate from what is given to us and that is all that is given to us so let's begin the process shall we okay let's begin so first thing first we know x is equal to 100 let's put it in here x is equal to 100 so that's step number one once we know once we know that x is equal to 100 100 plus 20 is 120 which means this must be 60 that's step number two. Once we know that this angle is 60, these are vertical angles, which means this angle must also be 60. That's step number three. Once we know this angle is 60 and we are given, this is given to us, which is why it's in black ink, 40 plus 60 is 100, which means, where well, the bloody hell is y? It must be here, obviously. Which means y must be 60 plus 40 is 100, y must be 80. How much is y? The answer is, is 80 degrees. Nothing to it. Sometimes I make too much fuss about nothing. Number eight. Number eight is asking us, number eight is asking us cost of each additional mile. What is the cost of each additional mile? I think we are riding in a cab. Question number eight. Not that it matters at all. Yes, a cab ride. Okay, so we are in the taxi, we are in the cab, and the question is, what's the cost of each additional mile based on the graph that they gave us? And the graph looks something like this. It starts out at three. One, two, three. It starts out there, and then it goes, this is three. 5, 7, 9, 5, 7, 9. If you look at the graph carefully, you will find that it starts out at 3, and at the end of first mile, the, the cost is $5. At, of second, at the end of second mile, it is 7 miles. At the end of third mile, it is 9 miles, and so forth. The graph looks something like this. In other words, in other words as we said before, it starts, it starts at $3, and then it goes up, then it goes up to it goes up to five dollars at one mile. It goes up to five miles at one mile, as you can see that here. Yeah? 
it goes up to five dollars when you have traveled one mile, which means that we are paying two dollars per hour, per mile. The answer is A. The cost of each additional mile after having gotten into the cab is two dollars. We have to pay three dollars to start out with, and then after that, each additional mile that we ride, the meter keeps going up by two dollars. That's the slope, and that's the intercept. Number nine. Like I told you, in the beginning, in the beginning they are, they are straightforward and simple, but they get progressively a little bit more difficult, as, the, uh, uh, as I said just now, as the, as the section progresses, and of course, towards the very end, they get, they get very tricky. Number nine. Number nine, uh, we're going to use the symbol throughout the, throughout the question. So we're going to use G for those people who buys gas. And we're going to use D for those people who buys drink. And that's the standard notation. G, if, it, if G represents something, then this is read as G bar. That's how we read it. G bar represents not, does not, does not buy gas. And similarly, D bar would simply mean does not buy drink. Does not buy drink. I'm using a symbol so I don't have to write everything down, okay? So here we go. Here we have G, G bar. We have D, D bar, and total. So apparently we're running a gas station, and one day we kept track of 135 people total. During the course of the day, 135 customers who walked in the store, we kept track of what we bought, what they bought. They more, they, they may have, they, 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 they may have bought other stuff, but we keep keeping track of. For those people who pump the gas in their car, do they also come in to buy the drink? That's what we're going to find out. So here are the answers, here are the numbers. So out of 135 people, out of 135 people who bought, uh, out of 135 people that we surveyed, that we kept track of, those people who came in the store, 135 people, of the 135 people, there were 60 people out of those 135 who bought the gas and the drink. There were 35 people who bought the drink but not gas and so forth. There's 25, there's 15, there's 85, and there's 50 degrees. So again, 25 represents the number of people out of those 135 people during the course of the day. 135 customers walk in the store and of those 135 people, they may have bought other stuff the other stuff would be in here. This 15 represents the people who did not buy the drink, who did not buy the gas. Well, if they did not, if they did not buy the gas and if they did not buy the drink, then what the bloody hell were they there for? Obviously, they, they came in there to buy something else. We are not interested in that. I'm making too much fuss about it. Let's just ask the question. The question is this. The question is, what are the odds? What are the odds of picking a person who did not buy gas. Out of these 135 people, what are the odds that if I were to pick one person at random out of these 135 people, that it turns out that that person did not, did not buy gas? Well, how many people did not buy gas? Raise the gas. That, this is the pe 85 people out of 135 people, 85 people bought gas, and out of those 85 people, those 60 also bought drink, the remaining 25, 25 did not buy the drink. Here's the total number of people who did not buy the gas. 50 people did not buy the gas out of how many? 135. There is your answer, 50 out of 135. Our answer is right here. What are the odds of picking a person who did not buy the gas? The answer is, the odds are 50 out of 135. That is the answer right there. And that is answer choice D. And that's all there was. That was the end of the page. I was going back and forth whether or not I should cover one more page in this video and I, I decided not to because I thought the video was going to be very long. So we're going to stop right here. We're not going to start a new page. We'll meet again tomorrow. We'll pick up obviously from where we left off. And again, as I said in the beginning of the video, 
if you if, if you ever want to get hold of me because you would like to work with me that you would like to hire me as your tutor to help you get ready for the exam not only I do the math part I also help people with the grammar portion the writing portion and of course I can help you improve your vocabulary I cannot help you much with the reading part because I'm not good at it but I can most certainly can help you in the reading part as I said because it's mostly dealt with grammar and I do know English grammar because I learned English as a non-native person non-native speaker so I know English grammar and I can also help you with the vocabulary and of course I can also help you with math. You can always reach me at kashwaniprep at iCloud.com. Alright, bye now.